All right, everyone, you're here for how to play Monster of the Week, the uh, tabletop role playing game. This is a modern uh, 2D6 based kind of horror focused game. Um, so in contrast to things like D&D, where you're playing a character inside of a fantasy world, um, you are playing a character inside of kind of a weird horror, um, modern, uh, kind of one shot based world. Um, so think things like uh, episodic kind of modern horror tales like Buffy the Vampire Slayer or X-Files, stuff like that. Um, it's also more kind of action focused. Um, so there's uh, sessions tend to move a little faster than things than traditional RPGs like uh, D&D. Um, what I mean by traditional versus modern um, is a it's set in a past time period or the current time period. So um, modern RPGs are typically set like 1920s and be and beyond. Um, so you can play Monster of the Week in really well, kind of it's it's suited towards 1920s and beyond. Um, modern day is the most popular where we're, you're actually playing like in the current time period um, of real life. Uh, and the character sheets are kind of um, moved towards that, but uh, you can definitely change things as you go. Um, so if you want to do a more kind of uh, Dark Ages, medieval fantasy type of thing, that's something you can do, but it's going to take a little bit of tweaking. Um, so yeah, this is the Monster of the Week tabletop role-playing game. You can download it here from evilhat.com slash product slash Monster of the Week. Um, so it has a core rulebook here, and then it has a Tome of Mysteries, which is kind of like an expansion rulebook. Um, the Tome of Mysteries also has a couple adventures that you can run. Um, adventures in this game are called Mysteries, um, and each mystery takes about a session to complete. Um, just like a mystery would be kind of fully wrapped up during a single... Uh, episode of an episodic TV series or something like that. Um, so yeah, uh, you'll want to get the core kind of Monster of the Week rulebook. It's $12 virtually. Um, if you want to expand your options and your player's options a little bit, you should also get the Tome of Mysteries. Um, you can get uh, the Tome of Mysteries for around $12 as two, two virtually, uh, and I think you can get a package deal for around $25 if you want a physical copy as well. Um, after you download these things, you'll want to look over them a little bit, and I will uh, kind of show you the highlights, but I do urge you to go out and read these completely if you are going to be running the, the game. Uh, but for playing the game, you don't need to know too much. Um, uh, a good place to start is like this example fight over here um, and stuff like that. Uh, so as for actually building your character and playing, um, let's start with kind of how to play first and then we'll get to how to build your character because it's good to know, um, you know, when you're making your choices for what you want, what those are actually going to be used for. Um, so the first thing is uh, kind of a rolling system. Monster of the Week is a little lighter on rolls than other um, kind of role playing games, uh, actual dice rolls than role playing games. Uh, because it's more focused towards kind of an investigatory nature um, and it doesn't have a whole lot of roles. Um, so in, if, you're in, if you're playing your kind of standard session of D&D, you might roll maybe 50 to 100 times during a session um, between damage rolls and attack rolls and stuff like that. In Monster of the Week, you're probably only going to roll around 10 times per session. Um, that doesn't mean that there's less action, it just means that the game isn't focused, uh, it doesn't have these very long kind of epic combats, um, unless you have a session that's really geared towards that or you've been building over it for a long time. It's kind of more about this investigatory nature and talking to people um, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, there's... When, whenever you're trying to do something in Monster of the Week, just as you might roll a 20-sided uh, dice in D&D and apply any modifiers, um, Monster of the Week is 2d6 based. So you're going to be rolling 2d6 and adding any uh, requisite modifiers and then um, comparing that roll to uh, two things on your character sheet. Um, almost everything in Monster of the Week has the same kind of DCs. So if you're familiar with D&D or, or you're usually trying to hit a DC or AC or a certain number, um, for Monster of the Week, those are always the same. So those are 7 um, through 10 and then, uh, well, those are 7 through 9 and 10 and above. Um, so typically if you roll a 1 through 6, you're going to fail. A 7 through 9 is kind of a uh, mixed success and then a 10 or higher is a total success. Um, 
And that's kind of how rolling works. We'll get to a little bit more about rolling, but when you miss a roll, you're going to have some kind of bad thing happen. Um, so, you know, in other traditional RPGs, um, you're typically just going to like lose time or like not to get a bonus. But in, in Monster of the Week, failing a roll really punishes you. Um, which is one of the reasons why there's not too many rolls, right? You can't just throw your dice and and um, kind of wildly at whatever you come about. You have to really think about um, what you're going to spend your resources on, what you're going to roll on, and what you're going to kind of uh, just do outside of the game system. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about the Hunter Reference Sheet before we get into building a character. Um, so these Hunter Reference Sheets are in the core rulebook here, as well as on the Monster of the Week uh, kind of website here. Um, you can download them here, the Hunter Reference Sheets. There's also two uh, Keeper Reference Sheets that you can download, um, um, and Mystery Worksheets that you're making if you're going to make adventures on your own. Um, and then I'll show you guys the playbook in a second. Um, you can download the playbooks here as well. All of these downloads are free um, and then you can also download the tome of mysteries playbooks right here um, and some new weird moves and phenomena which i'll show you a little bit about too but again these are expansions so some dms don't use them and they're always optional so yeah let's talk about hunt, hunt, the hunter reference sheets so the hunter agenda just kind of tells you um, how to play a rpg in general and what you're doing here as a player um, in monster of the week you're typically trying to um, find a particular monster, which changes each session, um, and stop them from whatever their dastardly plans might be. Um, and then the other bits here are just kind of good advice for general RPGs. Player hunter like they're a real person. You're kind of a character in this story. It's okay for bad things to happen to you, um, but you should kind of act heroic. Um, and then there's the basic moves. So there's seven basic moves that apply to pretty much everything in the game. And then each uh, hunter, each character, um, gets uh, special moves that they can do on their character sheet. Um, so let's talk about the basic moves to give you an idea of kind of how the game works. Uh, so kick some ass is the basic move that kind of uh, controls all of co most of combat. Uh, anytime you're doing a uh, combat roll, you're probably going to be rolling to, to kick some ass. Um, so this is what you're trying to do to inflict harm. So damage is called harm in this game. Um, and you have a certain amount of harm that you can suffer before you die, basically. Um, so yeah, uh, let's talk about the kind of miss, mixed success and stuff. And then I'll also be switching back to the missed rolls. Uh, I kind of wish the missed rolls, the, the failures, were on the Hunter reference sheet, but that's okay. It's also kind of an indie RPG, so there's not a whole lot of kind of documentation out there or, or things like that. Um, but yeah, so if you get a 7 or higher, you and whatever you're fighting inflict harm on each other um, based on stuff that's established in the game. Um, so if you're shooting something from very far away with a sniper rifle and it's a uh, creature that can only really do damage when it's up close, you're probably not going to get any harm inflicted on you. Um, this is only for things that are kind of existing and established. Um, and if you're running the game, you can see monsters have certain ranges for their attacks um, and hunters have certain ranges for their attacks. Um, Monster of the Week is also uh, a theater of the mind game. It's built without playing on a grid on mind. Um, so you'll see the ranges are very kind of um, not based on any particular unit or anything like that. They're just kind of conceptual, right? So there's like close range, far range, stuff like that. Um, and that's all rolled up in the kick some ass moves. Um, and it's really kind of DM dependent on w what is uh, what is in your range. But the general ranges are intimate, which is like where you're ha having to have uh, your body wrapped around someone. Um, there's hand, which is where you can reach your hand out and touch someone. There's close, which is like you're generally in the same room as someone. And then there's far, which is you can be pretty much as far away as you want. Um, and then you have these uh, extra successes. So on a 10 or higher, you roll 2d6, you add your tough for kick some ass, um, which is a stat we'll get to in a second. But you'll either be subtracting one all the way up to maybe adding three. Um, so yeah, uh, on a 10 or higher, you get an extra effect. Um, so you can gain the advantage. Uh, we'll talk about plus one forward in, uh, in a second. Um, you can inflict terrible harm and do an extra point of harm. You can suffer less harm or you can force someone where they want them. Um, a lot of the game is indie, so you'll see things like this in the rules where it's like, oh, you force them where you want them, which is not, uh, not something that you can really rely on to tell 
uh, your GM what they're actually need to do in every scenario. It's 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 an improv game, right? It's an indie improv game, which is part of the fun. Um, and the player can say, oh, I'm going to try to do this. And then the GM might let them do that completely, or they might do uh, kind of like a halfway compromise where, um, say you are fighting a creature and trying to knock it in a hole and you can say I f you force them where you want them where well if the creature is weak and the gm is ending uh fine with ending the fight there you might force them in the hole they fall down and go splat right um if you're fighting some kind of creature where they can climb up the hole the gm might say you know you force them down and they start to climb up and then their turn might be delayed or something like that um another thing about uh combat in this game is there's no initiative order um, so the same way you would go about kind of doing actions outside of combat where you uh, just kind of talk if something needs to happen um, that's kind of how monster of the week works um, and this is one of the aspects of the game that makes it very strong in person but not so strong uh, virtually because there's always this extra kind of wall of ice between you, yourself and others when you're playing virtually um, so this is one of the things that makes it really good in person, where you can kind of cue people in by um, looking over to them, um, which is something that you can't really do virtually. Um, but yeah, so that's how Kick Some Ass works. Um, and then on 12, and, and combat in general. Um, in 12 plus, you can get an extra effect, but this is an advanced thing. So this is something you unlock by your character sheets, uh, by leveling up. And it typically takes at least five or six leveling up to get an advanced effect. Um, so those are something that you should look into after you've already kind of gotten very comfortable with the game. Um, but the effects are here. Um, so yeah, let's talk about plus one forward and uh, stuff like that. So there's a bunch of different uh, kind of forward versus uh, plus one ongoing uh, versus hold one. Um, so plus one forward means you're going to take plus one to your next roll. Um, plus one ongoing means you're going to take plus one for a time period and it will tell you the role the game rules should tell you when that ongoing ends or if it's uh in a particular scenario or a particular scene um, so if you do very well in a maze for instance you might have plus one ongoing while you're escaping uh, if you have like a map of that maze or something like that um and then plus one forward is typically like just gaining an advantage in fights or something like that. Um, and then hold one is something that you'll see a lot in these rules here. Um, hold one, there will be a spot on your character sheet to kind of write in a number, and then you can spend that number to do certain things. Um, and we'll get into that in the next couple of uh, a couple of basic moves. So yeah, let's talk about the next ones. So act under pressure and help out. These are both your cool roles. Um, so this determines, you know, how you can keep your cool in tense situations. Um, act under pressure is kind of the most general uh, role. So if something else doesn't fit, you can always roll act under pressure. Um, and again, it's very kind of vague, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just kind of how indie games work. Um, so for act under pressure, you can set out to do what you're going to do. On a seven and nine, uh, the keeper, the game master, is going to give you a worse outcome, hard choice, or price to pay. Um, we should also start talking about missed rolls. Uh, so for kick some ass, you get your ass kicked. Um, so if you roll a one through six, you're going to get hurt, um, typically by the monster that you're attacking uh, and do little to no damage. Um, and then for act under pressure, things go to hell for you. Um, so you basically fail to act under pressure. Um, help out is helping out with your fellow companions. Um, this is something, again, in D&D, you might pile on to a help out role because there's no kind of, or there's typically not a uh, very um, kind of serious, detri uh, serious uh, effect on you if you fail. But with help out, there is still a serious effect on you if you fail. So on a 10 plus, your help grants them plus one to the roll. Um, on a seven through 10, you get a plus one to their roll, but you also expose yourself to trouble or danger. So this is typically not a great idea to do in combat, um, unless your cool stat is much higher than your tough stat, um, because you might as well just try to do damage yourself if you're doing you know similar amounts of damage. Um, so this is for like investigatory stuff and, and stuff like that, or when you really need to give someone that plus one. Um, and then there's an advanced thing as well. 
uh, for help out uh, failure, you expose yourself to trouble or danger without even helping out. So you're just putting yourself in a bad situation. Um, and then there's the uh, kind of investigatory stuff, which is investigate a mystery and read a bad situation. These are both the sharp roles. So these are kind of how keen you are um, and stuff like that. So investigate a mystery is based on a particular mystery. Um, so on a 10 or plus, you can hold two. On a seven through 10, you hold one. And then you can spend your hold to ask the following questions. So you can ask stuff like what happened here? What sort of creature is it? What can it do? What can hurt it? All that fun stuff. Um, this is basically for mysteries. Um, and then read a bad situation is basically the same thing, except on a 10 and plus you hold three instead of two. Um, and then you can ask a bunch of other, other questions. So these are the kind of question moves. Um, and mysteries are for mysteries and situations are for situations, like what's my best way in or out? Are there other dangers we haven't noticed? Stuff like that. Um, it's kind of up to the keeper which kind of sharp role you're going to use in which kind of scene, um, whether it's a situation or a mystery. Um, situation is typically for pa faster paced stuff and mystery is typically for kind of the slower paced. You haven't really totally figured everything out yet. Um, so yeah, that's how the sharp roles work. Uh, for missed roles, um, for investigative mystery, you're going to reveal something about the monster or something you're, or whoever you're talking to. So uh, in one of my mysteries, uh, someone was going through some uh, bits of paper that they picked up from a, uh, from like a monster hunting company um, and they failed the investigative mystery. And I, I said, you flip through a bunch of pages really quick and you're being careless and the pages fell out of the car. Um, and the car continues forward down the road, but then you see a monstrous hand uh, in the distance kind of pick up the pages. So you can cut away to other scenes like TV shows can do, and you can kind of tell the player stuff that their character wouldn't know in order to let them know that, yeah, you have revealed something um, to kind of the enemy. And then for read of ad situation, you can actually read it wrong or reveal tactical details to something. So this kind of gives your enemy the leg up um, instead of giving you the kind of uh, intel leg up that you were looking for. Um, you can also ask some other questions for investigative mystery. Um, there's a flexible investigations uh, kind of snippet in the Tome of Mysteries. Um, so if you find it's too restrictive, um, you can do this. Uh, so on a 10 or higher, you can ask the keeper two general questions or one specific questions. Again, this is vague. That's okay. It's supposed to be vague. It's vague so that you as players can kind of fill in the rules and do what you want to do. Um, and that's something about modern RPGs that are different than traditional RPGs. Um, there's not really any rules lawyering because you're not really supposed to rules lawyer. You're not supposed to, you're not, um... You're, you're supposed to, as a player, kind of put things into the game that other people are supposed to run with. Uh, so it's, it's more based on like improv rules than like game rules. Um, and it's more of an improv uh, ac action to play Monster of the Week. It's more improv than, than playing something like a video game. Um, so yeah, on a seven through 10, you can ask one general question. Um, so a, a, a general question, um, f for example, might be, Oh, what kind of monster is it? If we're in a world where, uh, you know, we've been fighting fey for a while, but also demons, say say we're in a world where there's like fey and devils and, or demons and in some kind of war over the worlds, they both want to kind of infest the mortal world, for example, um, then you can say, oh, what kind is it? And your keeper might say, oh, this is definitely a fey. Um, a specific question might be, uh, is this of the co summer court? Is this a fae of the summer court? Do we know its particular name? Do we know its particular capabilities? Stuff like that. Um, and then on a miss, the keeper gets to ask you a question, which is really cool. Um, so uh, that basically rolls up sharp. Uh, before we get to charm and weird, let's talk about uh, the other tough role, which is protect someone. So when where kick some ass is offenses, protect someone is defensive. Um, so you can protect uh, your fellow hunters and also NPCs. Um, so on a 7 through 10, you protect them, but you're going to suffer all or some of the harm um, that they were going to get. Um, and then on 10 plus, you can suffer less harm. All the impending danger is now focused on you instead of the NPC. You can also inflict harm back on the enemy um, or hold them back. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then for failures, you actually make things worse for protect someone. Um, so yeah, again, be careful with what kind of roles you're you're actually going to do. 
um, for manipulate someone. This is basically all the um, all the social roles in Monster of the Week. Um, manipulate someone is off of your charm. So charm is this social stat. It's how charming you are. Um, for a normal person means for NPCs, and then for another hunter means for your fellow players. Um, in my games, or your your players, you know, your fellow players' characters. Um, in my games, I don't like these for another hunter things. I think they kind of ask too much of your fellow players, especially in public games. Um, so I, I tend to focus on these four normal person ones. So on a 10 plus, they'll do it for the reason you gave them. Um, you have to give someone a reason for manipulate someone too. You can't just, you know, tell someone to do them and expect, uh, tell someone to do something and expect them to do it for no reason. Um, whether that's a bribe or a heroic reason or something else is kind of up to you as a player and what kind of resources you have within the fiction. Um, so on a 10 or plus, they're going to do it. Um, but if you ask too much, they'll tell you the kind of minimum uh, that it would take for them to do it. So so this is the best case scenario. Uh, on a 7 through 9, they're going to do it, but they're going to, uh, but only if you do something that, that kind of shows you how much you mean it. Um, so they're going to need something more from you on a 7 through 9, basically. Um, on a fail, I believe you just uh, kind of offend them. Uh, yeah, so for manipulate someone, the, the, heart, the hunter angers or offends the target. So that can really shut down uh, conversations quite quickly if you're not careful. Uh, oops, let's get back to the hunter reference sheets. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how charming and social stuff works. Uh, for use magic, this is where stuff gets weird. Um, and this is based on your weird stat. Um, so everything else so far has kind of been, you know, this modern um, TTRPG, and we haven't really talked about magic yet. Um, magic in Monster of the Week is wildly different from game to game and from setting to setting. Um, the way that magic works is something that you're going to have to figure out in your game. There's no spell list. There's no uh, kind of within the fiction of the rules. There, I mean, within the rules, there's no in fiction... Uh, kind of uh, establishing how magic works. Except for these, except for the rules here. So when you're gonna use magic, you're gonna roll weird. Uh, on a 10 or higher, it's gonna work without issues. And then on a seven through nine, it works imper imperfectly. So if it works without issues, you just choose an effect. If it uh, works imperfectly, you're gonna choose an effect and a glitch. And then the, your GM is gonna decide what effect the glitch has. So the effects are listed down here and the glitches are listed down here. So you can inflict harm, but there's usually better ways to inflict harm with weird if you're going to choose a character who's specializing in using magic. You can enchant a weapon and give it plus one harm. So if a weapon normally does two harm, it's now going to do three harm and have this magic tag, which might affect a monster that can only be uh, you know, hurt by magical attacks. Um, you can do one thing that is beyond human limitations. Okay, again, super vague. It, it clarifies, the rules clarify this a little bit in the um, Tome of Mysteries. Um, beyond human limitations is uh, not necessarily supernatural. So you can't be like, I want to gain the power of flight and then choose use magic. Beyond human limitations is like, I want to try to pick up this car. Because um, people can pick up cars. It's a thing that people can do. Um, it is just typically not uh, something that the average person can do, right? Um, and, and these kind of short effects are, are what use magic is for. Um, and it, again, it's up to your keeper if they want to allow this stuff. And as a player, think about, is what I'm going to do going to contribute to the narrative? Is it going to make it fun for other players? Um, is it going to make it fun for my, um, for my keeper? Is this where the story should be going? Stuff like that. Um, for effects, you can also bar a place or portal to a specific person or type of creature. So you can kind of salt to the lands and make sure a demon isn't getting in or something like that. You can trap a specific person, minion, or monster. Um, you can banish a spirit or curse from the person, object, or place it inhabits. This doesn't mean it's going to be banished back to the nether realm or anything like that. Um, it just might be severed from something that it's... Um, that it's possessing. Um, same thing for trapping. Um, this might trap the monster with you, for, uh, for example. Um, you can also summon a monster into the world. I've never seen a player use this, but if you're wanting to do kind of a summoner build, uh, I guess that's something you could try. You're just going to have to work that out, work that out with your keeper. Um, and uh, this is going to be based on, again, the kind of mythology that has been developing in your particular game. Um, and then you can communicate with something that you don't share a language with, observe another place or time, or heal one harm. 
Uh, you can also cure a disease or neutralize a poison. So yeah, that's everything you can do with use magic. It, it's it's just kind of everything else. Um, and again, it's very based on what your particular story says about magic. Every fiction has different magic rules. So pay attention to those magic rules before you do the use magic rules. Um, and then for glitches, the effect might be weakened of shorter duration. You might take damage. It might draw attention or have a problematic side effect. And then the keeper has a bunch of things that they can say um, to kind of uh, stop something from happening in game that goes against the kind of narrative. Uh, so the keeper can also say more than these things, but these are just kind of examples. So you might need something in particular. It might take a long time to cast or, or something like that. Um, and then big magic is just when you're trying to do something more than this, the standard use magic effects. Um, and these are things that uh, happen kind of outside of combat in, in particular, um, and kind of during downtime, maybe between mysteries or, um, or something like that. So you're going to take a, it's going to need a lot of people, a lot of time, something rare, um, something might go wrong. And, and this big magic process doesn't have any particular role, but it might use a bunch of different roles from the kind of core seven moves right here. Um, so yeah, that's how big magic works. Big magic is very rare as well. Um, and typically not done during sessions. So yeah, that's how you do all the moves. Um, and that's kind of everything that you can do within the rules of Monster of the Week. But again, if you ever want to do something in particular for any TTRPG, just tell your GM, hey, I want to do this. Um, what kind of role would it take? And is this allowed? Um, and then there's harm, recovery, luck, and leveling up. Harm and recovery are basically the kind of HP system of Monster of the Week. Everyone's going to have seven uh, capacities for harm. And then you take harm up to that level. So if you take two harm, um, you're fine. Uh, but once you get to four or more harm, you're going to be unstable. You mark the unstable box. It can be healed in its own ways or by just getting you below four harm. And uh, when you're unstable, you'll take extra damage when you're damaged um, or when you do uh, something particularly straining. Uh, seven, uh, yeah, eight harm or more is going to kill a normal human, including a hunter. Uh, so yeah, if you take eight harm, you're, 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 you're dead. You're dead. Um, and then recovery is kind of, uh, down here. Um, so if you're zero harm, you can get healed right away. Uh, zero harm is still a thing that a move can do. Um, so you might get slapped in the face and take zero harm, but that's still important because of harm moves. So whenever you take harm or whenever anything takes harm, um, the, the keeper can also give some harm moves. Um... So if you're doing zero harm, you might be momentarily inhibited. You might drop something or take minus one forward. Um, so if someone slaps you, you might take minus one forward to uh, any charm rolls within that uh, kind of social situation. Um, or if you get blasted back by a wave of air, but you're kind of on the back lines, you might take uh, you might drop something out of your hand. Um, if you take one harm or more, you might fall down, take minus one ongoing, pass out, or have intense pain. Um, these are just examples again. Um, the, uh, the keeper can still do more stuff. Um, but again, you're working kind of together with your keeper more than in traditional games. You're, you're telling a story together and it's more improv. Um, and then when you take eight harm or more, you die. Um, and unstable wounds, again, can get minus one harm whenever you take, plus one harm whenever you take additional harm. Um, and then there's some more information down here on page 213 of the, uh, of the core rulebook. Um, so yeah, that's how that works. Um, not every minion is going to have, uh, eight harm capacity. Some minions and monsters have more harm, some have less. Um, and that's something that you can see in the Tome of Mysteries mysteries or in the starter mysteries in the core rulebook. So yeah, that's kind of how health works. Um, and then you have luck. Luck is one of these things that's also kind of house ruled a lot. So this is going to be different based on which game you're in. Um, but whenever you spend a point of luck, you can decrease a wound you've suffered to zero harm or retroactively change the result of a roll to a 12. Um, luck's powerful. 
Uh, <laughs> and when you have no luck left, bad things will happen to you. And that's kind of talked about on your character sheet. Luck is very powerful. Um, and in the Tome of Mysteries, they kind of went back and uh, reined luck in a little bit by having luck specials. So whenever you choose uh, to use a luck point and your uh, keeper is using the Tome of Mysteries rules, there will be something bad that happens, uh, kind of in exchange for that luck point. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to the particular rule books or the particular playbooks, which are kind of the um, character sheets of Monster of the Week. Um, leveling up. Um, anytime you fail a, a roll, um, you're going to get an experience point. Um, so it's not all bad when you fail. Uh, and then when you get the fifth experience point, you level up and erase the other five marks. Um, and when you level up five times, you can choose from the advanced improvement list. Every playbook has their... Uh, has different levels ups, level ups, um, and different options for you when you level up. So it depends on what kind of playbook you're playing. And then at the end of the session, you also can get uh, experience by uh, answering these questions. So if you get two or more of these uh, questions answered yes, you get to mark experience. If you get three or four, you mark two points of experience. Um, so yeah, try to conclude the current mystery, save someone from certain death, learn something new and important about the word, world, and learn something new and important about one of the hunters every session. So these are kind of your goals as a player. And again, you can get up to two experience from doing that. Um, typically, you'll level up about once per session in Monster of the Week, um, depending on how fast your, uh, depending on how fast your narrative is going. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much everything you need to know for the basic game system. So now let's talk about actually creating a play, uh, a character. Um, so you'll want to look at the playbooks. Um, the Tome of Mysteries has some playbooks, and then the core rulebooks has some playbooks. I would stick to the core rulebooks for now if you're getting new to, if you're kind of getting started with the game, and look at the Tome rulebooks once you're kind of experienced and want something a little bit more complicated. Um, so yeah, the core rule books are all based on these kind of uh, archetypes that we see over and over again in kind of modern horror fiction. Um, so for Chosen, uh, your birth was prophesized and you're kind of the chosen one. Um, and you can see what the uh, different kind of hunters are in page, uh, uh, page 18 of the core rule books. Um, so your, your keeper should give you this when you're um, you know, picking characters and say, hey, here's what this kind of person is. Um, so that you can look through them at a glance and kind of see what the different playbooks do. Um, if you have a team concept, uh, you'll, you'll probably want to, you know, go towards that team concept when you're creating your character. Um, so here's the hunter types. Uh, and everyone's only, there's only allowed to be one of each hunter type um, in the game. That's why they're the chosen, not a chosen, right? So you're, you're not a chosen one, you're the only chosen one. Um, your keeper can waive this requirement if they want, but uh, it's kind of cool to stick to it. Um, so yeah, uh, once ordinary person who chose you have this special, who uh, discovered you have this special jet, special destiny, and you're chosen for something. Um, so Buffy from Va Buffy the Vampire Slayer, stuff like that. Um, good in a fight, some weird powers. Uh, crooked is a criminal that's kind of turned to the heroic side. Um, so you're good in social situations and you have a lot of contacts, so you can talk to people. Dresden Files is another thing that uh, Monster of the Week takes a lot of inspiration from. Um, Divine is an agent of some kind of higher supernatural power. Um, you're very tough and you have some holy powers. Um, so this is like Su uh, Castiel from Supernatural. Again, Supernatural is something with uh, a lot of insp that has given a lot of inspiration to Monster of the Week. Uh, an expert is a hunter who knows all about kind of monsters and magic and what they're going up against. Um, so you have a lot of hidden secrets and you know how to find out more and you have a base to kind of work from. Um, the Flake is a conspiracy theorist, um, just like Agent Mulder in the X-Files, another thing that gives a lot of inspiration to Monster of the Week. Um, and you're good at finding things out and seeing how things connect, especially from separate mysteries. Um, so the, the Flake is a pretty cool person to have on your team for uh, a long running campaign. The Initiate is someone who is uh, in a ancient sect of some kind. Um, so you're good with magic and your sect is sometimes going to provide help and sometimes problems. Uh, the Monstrous is a monster of some kind. Uh, you have high weird stats and a variety of strange kind of powers. Um, so you can be an angel or a werewolf or something like that. 
a mundane is just a regular person. Um, <laughs> so you're just kind of like a side, uh, not necessarily side character, but like bystander. Um, that's just kind of way over your head. Uh, you're really good at talking to other people and getting captured. So the mundane is actually good at splitting the party, which is kind of, um, can, can sometimes be fun in Monster Week. Funner than things like, you know, um, uh, things like Pathfinder, where you have these super tactical characters that are, uh, you know, uh, feeding off of each other's abilities and, and synchronizing and stuff like that. In, in Monster of the Week, splitting the party can be a lot more fun. Uh, the professional is someone that hunts monsters professionally as a full-time job. Um, they're good in a fight and a good team player, um, so you can help out your friends and stuff like that. Uh, Spellslinger is the traditional wizard. Um, so if you want to be a wizard or a sorcerer or someone like that, uh, the Spellslinger is definitely for you. Um, the Spooky is kind of like a psychic um, that has some kind of spells like the Spellslinger, but, but not to that uh, entire degree. Um, and they also have a kind of strange and sinister uh, ideas about them. Um, and then the Wronged is someone that's kind of revenge-driven um, and wants to kill a specific uh, kind of breed of monster. Um, so yeah, those are the different playbooks. Um, if you want to kind of compare these to like D and D classes or something like that, I'm kind of assuming you've you know what D and D is if you're watching this video. Um, the divine is kind of like a uh, cleric or paladin, um, and then the spooky is kind of like a warlock. But but don't get too uh, you know uh, caught up in comparing Monster of the Week to D and D because it is in entirely different. Um, but it but it happens a lot. So let's talk about actually filling out a core rule book. Um, if you're playing online, Roll20 is a really good uh, kind of resource for this, um, as is Apocabot. Um, so Apocabot is a Discord bot if you're using you know, text-based games or if you're playing just through Discord and you don't want to fiddle with Roll20 or any kind of tabletop, uh, any kind of virtual tabletop, um, Apocabot is great. It also, when you rolls, um, gives you that kind of... Uh, gives you the uh, result of your rolls and it has the missed uh, kind of uh, detriments that can happen to you together with the good things that can happen to you. So it'll say, hey, on a one through six, this happens. And then it'll also have this copied down from the Hunter reference sheets. Um, so Apocabot is great. Um, go download it and put it in your Discord server if you're playing through Discord. Um, but if you do want to fiddle with virtual tabletops, um, again, Monster of the Week is not built for playing on maps. So you're not going to have maps in this game. Um, everything's theater of the mind. But, Mon uh, but Roll20 does have very good Monster of the Week kind of character sheets. Um, so uh, here's what a rule book kind of looks like outside of Roll20. And then uh, you can go over to Roll20 and kind of fill things out very quickly here. Um, so let's take, uh, for example, maybe the mundane. That might be the, the easiest example to start with. Um, so you fill out your stats later, um, and then you kind of go on your character sheet, uh, you know, left to right, up to down. Um, so you're not, you're not filling out your stats or your luck or your harm or experience right now. This is kind of just the reference column. Um, but once you build your characters, you're going to start with this kind of middle column right here. So you get all the basic seven moves that we talked about, plus three more moves for your specific character sheet. And these are going to be flavorful moves that help you kind of fill out the archetype of what player your character, what uh, character you're playing. Um, so a mundane might be always the victim or stumbling across important things and stuff like that. Um, so some of these moves, most of these moves don't require rolls, but some of them do. So for example, panic button says when you need to escape, name the route you're try and roll sharp. Um, on a 10 plus you're out of danger, no problem. On a seven to 10, you can go or stay, but it's going to cost you. And then on a miss, you're caught halfway out. So these, these moves also tell you the kind of miss together with the good stuff. Um, so, uh, Power of Heart doesn't require rolls. So when you're fighting a monster, if you help someone, you don't have to roll cool. You can just automatically help as though you roll a 10. Um, oops uh, doesn't require rolls either. If you want to stumble upon something important, you just tell the keeper. Um, and then you'll find something important or useful. Um, again, more roll, uh, kind of improv rules than game rolls. Um, then you'll get one uh, gear. Uh, other classes get better gear than others. Um, so you'll get to pick exactly what it says. For the mundane, you're going to pick two weapons, checking these off. And then for a means of transport, you're going to pick one of these. 
Um, you'll have a name and some pronouns and some descriptions. You can choose these or you can kind of write in your own. Uh, and then you choose your ratings. So you don't roll for stats or anything like that. You just choose a line and you copy these down. Um, so you're always going to have plus two charm as a mundane. Um, and you'll typically be decently tough. You're, you're usually going to have plus one or zero. Um, and then the other stats are kind of up to you. Um, so for mundane, you're typically going to have low weird. Um, this is a pretty good, uh, and, and then the, the first line is a, always a very good kind of layout of stats. So this is kind of the average mundane. So you're going to have high charm, low, very low weird, uh, pretty good, cool and tough, uh, and middle of the pack sharp. Um, that's, you know, the most average mundane. Um, and then for introductions, you're going to uh, kind of tie yourself together with the rest of your party um, by these kind of uh, questions. Um, so you, this kind of depends on your keeper as well. Some keepers have everyone ask each other a question. Some people have one character ask one question. I like to have one character ask one question just to keep things kind of um, self-contained and so that everyone can remember these things. If you give people too much to focus on, they'll kind of forget everything. Um, and then there's leveling up. So once you choose those five experience boxes, um, you're going to choose one of these improvements. Um, and after you level up five times, then you can choose an advanced improvement. Um, you can only choose an improvement once, uh, but sometimes there's, you know, multiples. So you can take another mundane move twice, for example, and take a move from another playbook twice. Um, a lot of the uh, playbooks have this move that you can take a move from another playbook. So it's not like you're locked out of the other playbooks um, if you start with one. Um, and then another thing about this game is that um, you can actually create a second hunter to play as well as this one. Um, and you can retire hunters to safety, um, which is kind of the goal of the game, um, which is kind of considered bad in other like RPGs if your character gets removed from the game. But again, this is breaking the kind of mold of thinking of things about it as a game and, and more like an improv. Um, so yeah, that's the average character sheet on D on, uh, I almost said D and D beyond on roll 20. Um, when you choose a character sheet, your DM might give it to you. Um, but the, all the playbooks are here. You can see that there are some, uh, playbooks from the uh, Tome of Mysteries, like the Gumshoe or the Hex. Um, so you'll choose your playbook and then everything will pop up down here. You'll tick off uh, what choices you make. So for these moves, we have Premonitions, Big Whammy, and Jinx selected. And then you'll pick off, uh, tick off your experience and your gear as well. Um, and when you level up, you'll tick off your improvements. Um, whenever you need to roll, um, if you want everything done kind of automatically for you, um, Roll20 has that covered as well. Um, so if you want to roll general charm or luck and stuff like that, you'll click these set of dice. If you have a plus one forward, you can put it there and then you can hit submit and it'll pop up in the Roll20 chat right here. And it'll tell you if you failed and remind you to mark experience. Um, and then you can also click on the Hunter Moves reference. And this will pull up those seven moves seven basic moves that we went over act under pressure help out investigate a mystery it also has a flexible alternative here kick some ass manipulate someone protect someone read a bad situation and use magic and then there's alternate weird moves from the uh from the tome of mysteries and and a bunch of kind of expansive stuff here um, but let's just say you're trying to kick some ass um so we'll roll with tough which is the default um, but your keeper can ask you to choose something else if you want. Um, you'll put in your plus one forward and we have a mixed success. So that's pretty good. Um, this is also really, really good for like, if you have a complex character sheet, um, like a spell slinger, you're going to have a pretty complex character sheet because, um, your moves are going to, uh, have like bases and effects and you're going to be rolling weird when you're doing kick some ass instead of tough and and it, it gets kind of complicated with some of the character sheets so roll 20 can help you keep up with that stuff um and then of course you can track your harm here um so yeah that is all of the resources I have for you. That's the Roll20, that is the Apocabot, um, and where to find things, which is on evilhat.com. Um, make sure you're kind of uh, reading all of this stuff because in an indie game like this, uh, you can start out uh, very quickly, um, but some GMs might not know about missed rolls. Um, some GMs might not know about uh, the advanced thing, uh, the advanced leveling up. They might just think everyone starts with those kind of advanced uh, effects. Um, so yeah, hopefully this cleared up some uh, 
kind of misunderstandings that some of the community has. Um, and hopefully this helps you play Monster of the Week. Uh, it's a really, really, really awesome uh, role-playing system. And it's it's probably my favorite right now, to be honest with you. Um, and it, it really kind of captures... Uh, what's magical about Monster of the Week is that it captures... Um, that kind of relationship that should be going on between a GM and their players when they're telling a story together. And it asks a lot from the players um, because the moves are kind of vague and it, it asks you to bring some of your history into the game. But I really think it's it's uh, something that pays off kind of in the long run. And it's, it's something where you get out of it what you put into it. Um, and it's just an awesome base for a, a group that really does want to improv and really does want to tell a story of their own. Um, so yeah, I hope this, I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little bit more about Monster of the Week. Go out there, slay some monsters, kick some ass. I'll see you guys.